Hi everyone. I'm going to start talking about some applications of solutions. Okay. Uh, we're going to start talking about colligative properties. Colligative properties are kind of interesting. They're all solutions and the properties we'll look at, it depends entirely on the concentration of the material or solute dissolved. Okay. And what it actually does is it's really counting the amount of solute particles in the way of intermolecular forces. Okay, so we're disrupting forces between solvent molecules. This has a number of interesting effects relating to boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure, and even osmotic pressure, which we'll talk about. Okay, so the first uh, application is freezing point depression. So the freezing point will always go down when you add something to water, for example. So you add any solute to any solvent, that mixture's freezing point will be lower than the solvent by itself, and the boiling point will be elevated, it will go up. Okay, so we've kind of seen this uh, in real life, right? So you put salt in water to make pasta, one, to make it taste a little better, but two, to raise the boiling point. So when you add salt to water for cooking, salt raises boiling point of water, so things basically cook quicker, right? So if you put, if you boil in salt water rather than fresh, it cooks quicker and it also tastes a little better. Okay. Next one. <laughs> if you looked out the window, plenty of snow just recently. Okay. So we put salt on the roads in winter. Why? It lowers the freezing point of water. Okay. So when that snow and ice is on the road. Think about it more like ice, right? So you've got ice on the road, okay? Say it's at minus five degrees C or something. If you sprinkle salt on that ice, it actually melts and turns into water. So it's gone from a slippery flat surface to just a wet surface, which is more safe, right? Okay, so salt will, what we call, depress the freezing point of water. Any solute and any solvent, it will depress the freezing point of the solvent. Okay, and that's what we see. Now the key thing is here, okay, delta. Delta means change. So we add, so say we're increasing the boiling point of water, maybe it goes from 100 to 105 or something, okay, we add 5. So delta means an increase of 5. So we go from 0 to minus 5, right, that's a decrease of minus 5 delta, okay. So again, delta T will depend on essentially a constant to do with the solvent for sure, right, but the variable is the concentration of the stuff you dissolve, okay? So we have a couple of very, very simple equations. I'll put maybe a B here, all right? So the increase, let me put a, you know, I'm modifying my equations as I go, because if you think about it, when it's boiling point elevation, it's always going to go up, right? That's the key thing. It's always going to go up, so the change is always going to be a positive number, right? So it goes up from its actual boiling point a little bit higher, what's called the cryoscopic constant. So that's a constant for each material. And then the concentration molality, moles per kilogram, of the solution. Okay, so it's really measuring how much stuff's in the way, all right? How much salt is in the salt water? What's its molality, all right? Then we see freezing point depression. Again, delta T, it goes down. Maybe I'll put a minus in front just to kind of stress that it's going to go down, right? Okay, change in freezing point. Again, cryoscopic constant to do with the solvent. You know, typically we use water and we see those numbers down here in a second. And then the concentration of the solution itself. So change in boiling point or freezing point. Cryoscopic constant to do with the solvent, right? Okay, B for boiling, F for freezing. And then the concentration of the solution you're looking at. So say you dissolve two moles in a kilogram, it's two little m, isn't it? Right? Okay. Now for water, the numbers are for boiling, 0.51 degrees C per molality, and 1.86 degrees C for freezing per molality. And that's those numbers here and here. Makes sense, right? Because degrees C moles per kilogram, that has to be degrees C per moles per kilogram to make the units cancel. Okay. Careful with the units there, right? So that's degrees C per, you can put moles, kilogram, or little m. Either one's fine. Okay. So moving forward then. What do we see? <clears throat> now, a little trick actually before we do a question. When we actually look at um, delta T, either the elevation or the depression of 
boiling point, freezing point, it's a difference, right? So it doesn't matter if we use Kelvin or degree C because a difference of 100 Celsius is a difference of 100 Kelvin, right, between boiling and freezing point of water. The step sizes, if you remember that when we talked about this in 101, if you took my class, the step sizes on the Kelvin and the Celsius ladder are the same, okay? All right, so we will, because it's a change in temperature, preferentially use Celsius. Okay, now here's a great worked example. All right, now if you like, this, the equation is actually pretty straightforward. All right, okay, I'll read it and then I'll maybe pause, let you guys try it. Right, so calculate the freezing point. Now be careful, right? Calculate the freezing point means the actual freezing point, not the change in freezing point, the actual freezing point. So it's going to be probably a minus number, isn't it? Right, it's going to go from zero to minus something. So calculate the freezing point of a 30% by math ethylene glycol solution. Okay, I think glycol is used as antifreeze. Okay, so let's work out the 30% by mass freezing point of an ethylene glycol solution. Okay, now to set you up, you need a couple of pieces of information, right? So don't forget, of course, delta TF, I put a minus there, equals <laughs> KFM. All right, so that was from the previous page. All right, so let's just zoom back a second. So the depression of freezing point is the cryostopic constant times the molality. All right, and then we remember molality itself, this thing here, equals moles of solute per kilogram solvent. Now remember that one, right? Kilograms of solvent. It's the weird one we use for high concentrations, right? Okay, so let's think about this. So what I like to do, whenever I have one of these concentration type problems, I remind myself of the equation, yeah, so we'll go through this first, and then once we've established what the concentration is, the molality in moles per kilogram solvent, we'll take this over here and then just plug and chug to find the depression in freezing point, and then remember at the end, that's not the answer, right? That's how much it was depressed, and we'll take away from zero to get the answer. Okay, so remember the trick? 30% by mass when we did our percent masses, right? So assume 100 grams. Now that's, you know, this would be a great place to pause, wouldn't it? Because I've given you all the hints you need, right? Okay, so you assume 100 grams, so that's 30 grams of ethylene glycol, this formula, you can work out moles, right? Hey, 30 grams difference to 100 is 70 grams, that in kilograms would be kilograms of solvent, moles per kilogram M, stick it in, crank it out. Okay, pause, give it a go. I'll come back with the answer. All right. Oh, you're back? Okay, so let's do it on the side. I'm just copying my notes from over here. So I've got 30 grams of uh, ethylene glycol. That means I've got 70 grams of solution, right? Water, right? It's a, it's a water solution. Okay, and it, you know, it's kind of um, often just implied it's water, right? Okay, so and that equals, I can just work that out on the fly, right? 70 grams is 0 0.070 kilograms, okay? It's not 101, you don't have to show me grams to kilograms anymore, right? <laughs> okay, but just make sure you show it, right? So it's all show all work and you can, you know, that's okay. Now, so we've got the bottom part, right? Boom, so I'm gonna go over here, M equals, I'll fill in the moles in a second, but the kilograms is 0 0.07, zero kilograms, isn't it? Okay. Now, if I look it up, we'll work it out. C2H6O2, molecular weight, C2H6O2, 216, 61s, 212s, equals, I write it down, okay, it is 62. 62 grams per mole, therefore, remember the little triangle, moles equals 30 grams over 62 point, well, 62 grams per mole, which equals, let me get that down, what is that, 0.45, no, 0 0.4, 0 0.48 mole. Okay. Oh, I'm just about squeezing that on. C2, H6. Two. Now my <laughs> work kind of straight a little bit over there, right? So I got this number. I'm just going to stick it on top here. This is if you like where the good part is. 0 
moles, 0 0.07 kilograms equals 6.9 moles per kilogram or 6.9 little m. Fair enough, right? Okay. I'm not there yet. Okay. I've kind of not, not, not left myself a lot of room, have I? But um, we're not quite there yet. Okay. So that's the concentration. All right. And maybe just because I'm running out of space and, you know, obviously you're going to be a lot neater than me, right? I'll go to the top here and I say, well, delta T equals KF times M. Previous page. KF for water was 1.86 minus 1.86 units are degree C per M. Concentration was uh, 6.9 M equals minus 13 degrees C. Oh, no. Yeah, that's right. Minus 13 degrees C. Now that's the change. Now be careful. There's always like five points or so at the end. Therefore, right, write this, therefore freezing point equals zero minus 13 degrees C, which equals minus 13 degrees C. All right. I know it's the same number, but if that was a boiling point elevation, it wouldn't be a boiling point of 13, would it? It'd be a boiling point of 113, right? Because I'm adding to 100. I'm subtracting from zero, which makes it minus 13. But hey, show will work. Show will work. Okay. Let's just recap that. So there's our equation for change in freezing point, cryoscopic constant times molality. We worked out molality using our standard trick with percent mass, plugged and chugged. Got the answer. Okay, how that makes sense. All right. Now, all well and good. Let's try one now with the boiling point, right? Just to show it, it goes the other way. But before we go the other way, real quick, remember what I said on the first page? Well, you know, the first uh, few things I said was it's all about the concentration of stuff in the way, right? So this was a molecule, right? If it's got like a formula like this, it's a molecular solute, meaning it stays intact, right? So molecular solutes, sugar, alcohol, when they dissolve, they dissolve by making hydrogen bonds. So they stay as intact molecules, right? So the moles of ethylene glycol I add is the moles of ethylene glycol molecules swimming around. Fair enough, right? However, if I look at something that say ionic material, and ionic material, like NaCl, right? So one mole of NaCl, when it dissolves, makes two moles of ions because it dissociates. Ah, a little trick there, right? So whenever you get an ionic material, if it breaks apart to form two ions, it's twice as concentrated because you're just counting stuff in the way, <laughs> right? If it's like this one down here, it breaks up to form three ions, it's three times as much stuff in the way. Fair enough, right? Okay, so Let's look at uh, the question. So unlike molecular solutes, ethylene glycol above, ionics make more than one thing when dissolved because they undergo dissociative, dissociative dissolution, right? Okay, so for example, NaCl gives you two for one, right? For every one compound formula, you make two dissolved ions, right? So the concentration of ions is higher, right? Now, therefore, when I do my equation, so delta T, it's going to be, I'm going to put it like this, right? I, K, in this case I'm boiling, M, right? So that's the number of ions if it's ionic, right? And I, I'll do that, little, that's not in the book, right? So I'll do that little trick with the I for number of ions when we do osmotic pressure at the, at the end of the packet, right? So if I'm doing that with this one, right? So what is the boiling point of a solution that's 2.5 molar NaCl, right? So that's going to equal, we don't have to work out the concentration, it's done for us, right? Okay, so that equals 2, because it's Na and Cl, Kb, that's the smaller one, 0.51, right? Water number. Oh, degree C per mole. Oh, sorry, degree C per molal. Times 2.5 M. Boom. What I get is, let's just write it here. 
Well, why don't you just, you just crank the handle, pause me, work it out. Okay. The change in boiling point is 2.55 degrees C. That's not the boiling point though, is it? Therefore, boiling point equals 100 degrees C plus 2.55. 102.55 degrees C. Okay, be careful, right? Okay, fair enough. So salt water, its boiling point goes up by two and a half degrees if it has that concentration of dissolved sodium chloride. Fair enough, that could be a pasta water, right? Could be. All right, now, <laughs> maybe you sprinkled some of this stuff on your driveway last week, okay? It's actually called quick melt, right? So in the shop, there's something called quick melt, which says it melts snow and ice more quickly. That's advertising. <laughs> okay. It actually melts snow and ice down to a lower temperature, right? Okay, because it's calcium chloride. So quick melt should actually be called lower temperature melt. <laughs> But how low does it go, right? Because you've got three ions, because calcium chloride breaks up into three ions, right? So therefore, delta T, and I'll put it here, calcium chloride, equals three times, same concentration, zero, oh, two point, oh, let me do the same, uh, same solvent, 2.5 is the concentration, 0 0.51 degrees C per M times 2.5. So the only thing that's different is the number of ions, right, in solution, yeah? It's three times the concentration of the base formula, and that equals 3.8. So therefore, 100 plus 3.8 equals 103.8 degrees C. So yeah, so quick melt, sorry, quick melt, quick boil in this case, sorry, my mistake. Same thing, right? So what works for boiling works for freezing. It is sold as quick melt, but if I throw it into water, it would actually raise its boiling point. Similar idea. Okay. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. So when you have an ionic material, modify the formula. I for ions. I would be one, right? Just mathematically for a, for a molecular material. All right. Okay. So all well and good. Now, Next thing we're going to talk about is phase diagrams. Okay, so phase diagrams, you've seen a little bit about this already probably. What is a phase diagram? Well, it's a graph that represents values of pressure versus temperature for a pure material, right? So every pure material has a phase diagram and the phase diagram has pressure and temperature, okay? And then we know, for example, if we're a really cold temperature, that thing's gonna be a solid. If it's a really high temperature, that thing's gonna be a gas, yeah? But that also depends not just on temperature, but also on pressure. So under a high pressure, for example, a gas will condense to form a liquid, right? So there are regions of temperature and pressure where things are solid, liquids, and gas. And that's what a phase diagram gives you, okay? So here's your generic phase diagram, okay? Now what I'm gonna do real quick, this isn't the water phase diagram, it looks slightly different, but it's close, right? So I'm going to kind of put a line across here, kind of where we live, and you could imagine this a bit like water or something, right? All right. So that might be one atmosphere. And that's our atmospheric pressure here on the planet Earth, right? So that's, if you like, fixed, yeah? So you go outside, it's one atmosphere all the time. The thing that changes outside is the temperature, yeah? So as temperature goes up and down, we move from at low temperature, solid to liquid, and just follow the line here. So that would be solid to liquid, that's when it melts, right? And then from liquid to solid, that's when it boils, okay? And this is, this is the kind of the transitions we're familiar with. So for water, that's zero, oh, Kelvin, 273 Kelvin, 373 Kelvin, right? This is a generic diagram, so I'm not gonna write on it, right? Okay, well, numbers, okay, so. Let's look at features of this graph. It kind of makes sense, yeah, but I want to kind of go over them, all right? So, push this up just a little bit so you can see everything. There, about there, all right? Boiling point. So the boiling point is obviously where liquid turns to gas. So this line here is when liquid turns to gas. That's kind of our boiling point line. Condition of P T 
where liquid turns to gas. Obviously, it is a little bit affected by pr pressure, right? So if you look at the vertical axis, it's not a straight line, right? It's not a straight line up and down. It's kind of almost like a 45 degree line because if you put a liquid under pressure, like in a pressure cooker, it will have a higher boiling point. That's how pressure cookers work, right? If you're on top of a mountain, less pressure, lower boiling point, yeah? So as pressure decreases, so does boiling point. As pressure increases, so does boiling point. We don't see that usually in our everyday lives too much because we live at one atmosphere. But hey, if you increase the pressure, boiling point goes down. Sorry, up. <laughs> if you increase the pressure, boiling point goes up. If you decrease the pressure, boiling point goes down. Okay, so that's the line, right? Okay. Next one, keep it easy, right? Freezing. Now this one's almost vertical because where, because liquids and solids can't really be compressed, unlike a gas, right? So because they can't really be compressed, the line is essentially vertical. There's no effect on pressure with regard to where it changes from a solid to a liquid, yeah? So the melting point or the freezing point is pretty much invariant with pressure, but of course it does depend on temperature, right? Okay, so that's the line where condition of technically pressure and temperature where solid, I, I'm going to put turns into liquid. And it goes either way, right? Because you can go melting or freezing and up here boiling or condensing for the gas, right? Okay. Fair enough. So those are the ones we're familiar with. Nice and easy. It's nice and easy, right? Now the weird ones. <laughs> now the weird ones. Look at that point right there. Look at that point right there. All right. What does that mean? It means all the lines come together, right? So at that point in nature, whatever that condition of temperature and pressure, because all the lines meet there, that means all three states of matter can coexist simultaneously. That's kind of a weird concept to us because it just, we just don't see it every day for water, do we? We don't see steam, water, and ice all in the same container. That's because the pressure's off, right? There is a condition of temperature and pressure where they can all exist at the same time. Okay, so the triple point is where solid, liquid, and gas exist simultaneously. Interesting, and every pure material has a triple point, and this is how you can actually, these days, you can very, very accurately calibrate a thermometer because you just use water, and when you've got all three phases at the same time, you know you're at the triple point, which has a certain pressure and temperature, okay? So extra credit. Email by Friday, right? What is the triple point of water? What is the triple point of water? What temperature is it solid, liquid, and gas all at the same time? Condition of temperature and pressure, solid, liquid, and gas all at the same time. Fair enough. All right. Next one, critical point here. There it is there, right? So if you look, these lines seem to go on forever, yeah? But the, the liquid to gas line seems to have a, f a finishing point, right? Which is kind of weird, right? What it means is past this point, which is called the critical point, you can't tell the difference. So something there, right? Or something there. You can't tell the difference between a liquid and a gas past the critical point. Why is that? It's kind of an interesting point, right? So if I take a gas, there are gas, right? And I compress it down, you know, like with a piston or something, it gets to the point where the gas is so compressed that intermolecular or interatomic distances actually in the sample now are the same as a liquid, right? So the gas is compressed, so the distances in the gas between particles are the same as in a liquid, right? So the densities are the same. So once you get to, when you get to the point where the density of the liquid and the density of the gas are the same, you can't tell them apart. So that's why the line stops there. So the critical point is where density liquid equals density gas. Cannot tell difference. <laughs> if that makes sense. So that's what a critical point is. So when people talk about critical point, you know, or critical liquids, it's where the density of a gas has got to the point where it's, in, you know, indistinguishable. That's the word I'm looking for. Indistinguishable from the liquid because its density is the same. All right. For all intents and purposes, it's the same thing past that density. Okay. Finally, sublimation. 
that's this point here. Sublimation, as you may remember, is what dry ice does. So dry ice is called dry ice because it goes directly from a solid to a gas. It skips the liquid phase altogether. So if I drew the, you know, this would be one atmosphere for CO2, right? Because for CO2, it goes directly from solid to gas at one atmosphere. So there are conditions of pressure where certain materials will, once they're below the triple point pressure, they will go directly from solid to gas. Move that up so you can see it. So there's my kind of like CO2 one atmosphere line. CO2 goes directly from solid to gas at one atmosphere because for its phase diagram, one atmosphere is below the triple point pressure, right? Okay. And we see this transition. This line represents sublimation, transition from solid to gas, skipping liquid. Okay. So, so that's a condition of pressure and temperature where solid goes back and forward to gas without going through the liquid phase. Okay. So some things do that at one atmosphere. CO2 is an example. Dry ice, right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> Flip over. It's a good place to stop actually because I've got like literally one minute left before my timer tells me to stop. All right. So think about this without, I'm not going <laughs> to kind of show you the answer. Uh, nothing to see here. Okay. <laughs> we'll reveal the answer in a second, but just think about those phase diagrams. And we've already talked about it a little bit. So when we put salt into water or sugar into water, ethylene glycol into water, we have a boiling point elevation and a freezing point depression, right? So the change, the temperature line has shifted, yeah? So we've shifted to a higher temperature for boiling and a lower temperature for freezing. So it's gonna kind of shift those lines, lower, freezing, higher, boiling, right? So just think about it, right? Maybe do a little sketch on the side before you peek, right? How would the phase diagram be changed if we turn it from a pure solvent into a solution. Yeah, so we add more and more and more solute. We see an elevation in boiling point, lowering in freezing point. How would that change the phase diagram? It's basically going to shift those lines, isn't it? Okay, so I'll talk about that in a second. So I'll stop and come back. See you in a second. All right, so I kind of mentioned it, right? So you can write little notes up here, but very basically, look what happens, right? So here is the solid to liquid line, so that's freezing, right? So the water phase diagram is a little different than the generic. If you look at the generic, I got a nice one in the appendix, right? So in the appendix, this line is essentially vertical, right? For liquid to solid. But water's kind of unique in that the line tilts slightly backwards, so to speak. That's because um, solid water ice is less dense than liquid water, which is an unusual property for matter, and that's why the line slopes the other way slightly. It should be kind of more vertical, but that's just because of density differences, okay. But you know, it's still <laughs> essentially vertical, isn't it? Okay, so if we think about freezing, freezing point is depressed, right? So as we add one mole of sodium chloride to water, it marches a little bit to lower, well, lower temperature, right? So lower temperature, and then we add more, it goes to lower temperature, still add more lower temperature. So we shift that line between solid to liquid transition melting, right, to lower and lower values. So we're having a graphical representation of what we worked out earlier for ethylene glycol, right, when we saw that the actual number was like negative something, right? There it is in graphical form, okay? And then we looked at quick melt or quick boil, and we saw that, hey, when you add stuff, the boiling point goes up, and that's exactly what we see here. So there's the liquid to gas, that's boiling, and we see the boiling point go up as we add more. So we, you know, we can just modify our phase diagrams for our solutions, but we're modifying the phase diagram of the solvent. Okay, remember it's all about the boiling point and freezing point of the solvent as you add things to it, and it becomes colloidal, we say, right? Okay, all right. Okay. Oops, got to start my timer here. Okay. Now, the next application is vapor pressure. Okay, vapor pressure lowering. Okay. Which ties in nicely with what we've been talking about so far. Okay. Now, let's just kind of recap what we're doing. Try and think back to um, chemistry 101 a little bit for the, from the, you know, when you did that experiment, when you collected over water and you worked out the vapor pressure and subtracted it when you did your, one of your labs, okay? 
Uh, maybe I'll link that, okay? So if you need to go back and review vapor pressure from the gases packet, I'll link that, okay? But I will kind of review it on the fly a little bit, okay? So remember what vapor pressure is. It's essentially humidity, right? So let's say I have some water in a flask, yeah? Okay, I put a stopper on the flask, yeah? And at whatever temperature it is, there's always a little bit of water vapor evaporates, yeah? Because that's what humidity is. Humidity is water vapor escaping from lakes and rivers and streams and puddles into the atmosphere, yeah? So on a really, really hot day, it feels very humid, doesn't it? It feels real close and clingy because there's lots of water vapor in the air, lots of dissolved water vapor around us, yeah? But on a super cold day, the air feels really dry and we get cracked lips and things like that, right? Okay, because the humidity is very, very low. So the, the, the amount of water vapor in the air is dependent directly on temperature, okay? Well, I shouldn't say directly because it's not a straight line relationship as we'll see in a second, but let's just talk about it again, right? So we have our liquid in a container, water, say, right? We put a cap on it and some water vapor, you know, this is why if you leave your glass of water on the nightstand, you come back a week later and there's no water in the nightstand anymore, right? In the glass on the nightstand, because it eventually will evaporate, yeah, over time. It wasn't pixies or anything <laughs> coming along, right? Okay, so an open container just left there, eventually it will run dry, won't it, right? Because all the water escapes, yeah? But if you put a lid on a container of water, the water will evaporate and fill the space above the liquid until it reaches a certain pressure or a certain vapor pressure, yeah? And then it just can't exceed that, right? So that vapor pressure is dependent on temperature. And then as one evaporates, one goes back down, and we call that a dynamic equilibrium. So it reaches a constant value. There's exchange between liquid and gas. That's called a dynamic equilibrium, but the amounts don't change, okay? It's like a revolving door. As one person goes in, one comes out. We'll talk about this when we do equilibrium, okay? So once that dynamic equilibrium is established, there's a certain pressure at a certain temperature, right? And that's what this graph is here. You may remember this from Chemistry 101, right? So in Chemistry 101, we referred to the vapor pressure of water graph. So we could say, oh, 20 degrees C, 40 degrees C, what's the vapor pressure? And as you can see from the graph, it has an extremely exponent exponential shape, right? Okay. So it's not linear, all right? So we have to look up the number. What's the vapor pressure at a certain temperature? Okay. Now, if we do look at that graph, yeah, when we look at 100 degrees C, which we know to be the boiling point of water, that's kind of a unique thing, right? So 100 degrees C, we read over here, oh look, it's 2760 millimeters of mercury, uh, 760 torr. So that's what the definition of boiling is, right? So when we get to the boiling point of the liquid, 100 degrees C for water, the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. And if you think about it, once the vapor pressure pushing against the atmosphere is equal or greater, it all boils, right? So that's why things suddenly boil when they get to the boiling point, because they've got enough energy now to push back the atmosphere and just leave the container. So boiling happens when vapor pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure. So therefore, if you're up a mountain where the vapor pressure has to get slight to only slightly lower number, doesn't it? Because if you think about it, up a mountain, there's less atmosphere above you, so it's not pushing down 760, is it? It's probably pushing down 750, right? So the thing boils at a lower temperature down here where 750 is, right? So that would be up a mountain right there. If I went down a coal mine, it would have a higher boiling point. If I had a pressure cooker, which has the lid on it, so the pressure gets higher inside there, the water boils at a higher temperature in a pressure cooker. That's why it cooks food quicker. Ah, cool stuff, right? So. Bottom line is, think of vapor pressure like humidity. There's always going to be some finite amount of water vapor escaping from a glass of water. And it just, if you like, there's just more of it as the temperature gets higher. If you get to the point where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, it boils. And that's related to the boiling temperature. Okay, but below the boiling temperature, it's partially, if you like, going away, right? It doesn't all go at once. Okay, all right, and these, that's called a, a vapor pressure. Okay, so if you like, I like to call it, think of it like humidity. If you have a closed container, there will always be some amount of evaporated liquid sitting as a gas above its parent liquid. We call that the vapor pressure, and the vapor pressure actual value is related to temperature via an exponential form. Okay, all right. <laughs> we already mentioned that one. What's the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees C? 
760 millimeters of mercury, atmospheric pressure, right? That's the definition of boiling when vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Now, here's an interesting question. <laughs> Don't you've ever uh, had to dry clothes manually, maybe you've been camping or something, right? So yeah, <laughs> you know, you get your clothes out on the line, right? And you know, you know, you know, just from common sense when, you know, when's a good day to dry clothes, right? A good day to dry clothes is when it's windy and when it's warm, okay? And you can think about that in terms of this argument right here, right? So if you think about it, you have to excuse my phone there. So here's my favorite Liverpool shirt, <laughs> right? So I've just washed it, yeah? The warmer it is, the more liquid's gonna turn to gas at that temperature. So it's gonna dry quicker at a higher temperature because there's a higher vapor pressure of water above it than dissolved in it. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Okay, so it comes off and there's a higher pressure of water up here at a higher temperature. So higher temperature, yes, higher vapor pressure, fair enough. But then if you think about it, if it's a really still day, it's almost like it's in a closed container, isn't it, right? So that water vapor is just still sitting there. So once it's there, it's just going to stay there. No more is going to come out of the shirt and the shirt's going to stay wet, right? Okay. So if you're, uh, <laughs> this is kind of how saunas work, right? no, we don't go there, but um, kind of the same concept. In a sauna, you have a room and, you know, we get that water vapor in the air in the sauna and it, it doesn't dissipate, right? So it's, you know, it stays kind of hot in the sauna. Anyway, back to this. So we get that vapor pressure above the shirt, say the wet shirt, and no more water's gonna evaporate while it's still sitting there. So if I have a windy day, what does the wind do? It pushes that liquid away, right? So then it can fill the space again, right? So wind to remove the evaporated material, which is then replaced, hot, so there's more of it coming off at that temperature, okay? So warm, windy days are the best days to dry washing on a line, due to this argument, right? Make sense? Okay. All right, now, this is where we get into a little bit of, um, I'll take it nice and slow. It's been a nice conversation so far. Hopefully you've been able to follow along. But when we get into the math of this situation with solutions, it gets pretty interesting, okay? So first things first, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna talk about Routes' law. Routes' law is very simply a relationship between vapor pressure and mole fraction. So I'm going to have a solution. Maybe it's, well, we'll use one of our examples for a second, octane and heptane, right? So two volatile organic materials, right? So I get these two volatile liquids and I make a solution out of them, right? And that solution can be heavy in one and light in the other or the other way around, right? So I can start with a mole fraction of one, which means zero with the other, all right, or a 50-50, which is right in the middle, or one to zero, right? So we can go from all this one to all this one and fractions in between, 70, 30, 40, 60, etc. right? 50-50 would be the middle. So the mole fraction is just basically saying, hey, what fraction of the moles is one thing, what fraction of the moles is the other? And that's the definition of mole fraction, okay? Now, so we've got two volatile materials, right? So we've got a volatile solute and a volatile solvent, right? So they're both going to want to evaporate, yeah? So let me just draw a picture over here, right? So imagine a container with molecule A and molecule B, yeah? Both of them are low boiling point, they're volatile, right? So you put a cap on this container and they both, not just the solvent like when we did the pure water, right? But they both get into the gas phase above the solution, yeah. So we have a mixture of vapors above a mixture of liquids, yeah. And this is all about what's happening in the vapor. Okay, so Routes' law, Routes' law really defines how this vapor is formed, what its composition is, and things like that. Okay, so using words, right? So I'll give you some definitions from Routes' law, right? And then we'll translate that definition into a math equation, yeah? And then we use the math equations to solve problems. Now, if you want to go back and look at your gases packet again, we did talk about the first one 
and the second one if you took my class in 101, right? So here we go with the first one. The first one is Dalton's Law, right? So the total pressure up here, right? The total pressure, okay, we call that PT, above a mixture in equilibrium, so you have to let it get to, you know, that point where it's stable, right, which is always assumed, right, is equal to the sum of the components, <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful, partial pressures. Now, you may remember this when we talked about air. So if I go down here and talk about math, right? So the total pressure of the air equals the partial pressure of nitrogen plus the partial pressure of oxygen plus, say, the partial pressure of argon, which, you know, is just 1%, right? In our generic mixture, it's the partial pressure of component A plus the partial pressure of component B. So maybe I'll put that there. All right. The pressure of A plus the pressure of B is the total pressure of their mixture. That's common sense, right? That's Dalton's law of partial pressures, right? Okay. So we'll use that, right? So the total pressure in there is the pressure of one gas plus the pressure of the other. And individually, those gases have partial pressures, generically A and generically B, right? But it could be ethanol and hexane, or in this case, it's heptane and octane, right? Okay. Fair enough, right? So the Total pressure of a gas mixture is equal to the sum of its partial pressure components, right? Okay, hopefully you remember that one from before. All right, now, next one, what about the individual partial pressures? What is the partial pressure of, say, hexane in the mixture, right? Okay, so the vapor pressure of a component now think about that for a second, right? It's going to depend on two things, right? It's going to depend on how volatile its like liquid form is, right? So if one of these has a much lower boiling point than the other, there's going to be more of it evaporating, okay? So it's going to depend on the kind of natural volatility of the material itself. And then, hey, if there's it's 90% that stuff, it's also going to depend on the mole fraction of that stuff, right? So the more there is and the more volatile it is, the more will evaporate, right? So the vapor pressure of a component above a mixture is proportional to its mole fraction. Well, in the book they talk mole fraction, but it's also to do with its kind of natural vapor pressure, right? Okay, so let's do an equation for that. So P A, for example, equals the mole fraction of A. So that mole fraction is a percent as a fraction. So 90% would be 0.9. So say I had 100 moles, 90 were A and 10 were B, mole fraction would be 0.9, wouldn't it? All right, so there's that. And it's, I think it's called a chi, right? <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> I don't want to go off on a rant here, but that's kind of a deep space nine thing, isn't it? Right? <laughs> and that's the pressure of the pure solvent, right? So at that temperature, right? So when we look back at the water diagram, just for a quick second, you know, every, every material has its own graph and it's always recorded at 20 degrees C. So whatever the vapor pressure of the pure thing is, that's a constant times the mole fraction equals partial pressure above the liquid. Okay, so yeah, so I guess that's why the book says that's not a variable because it is a constant, right? But it's in the equation. So that's the partial pressure above a mixture of one component equals its mole fraction in the mixture, right? times its natural vapor pressure at, I think it's, yeah, actually 25 degrees C, not 20. Okay, so we look at these partial pressures at 25 degrees C. All right, so let's try a worked example together, all right? Okay, so it's actually easier than you think, all right? The hard part is um, just keeping these two kind of uh, ideas the same. Actually, before I go on any further, I want to do something real quick. All right, so uh, that's my ruler, 
right? I can actually give you a graphical, and it's right here, all right? A graphical example of Routes law, and I should have done that earlier, right? So this is the classic Routes law plot, right? So we have vapor pressure up the side, yeah, and then we have the red component. Maybe that's component A, right? That's what it says. So if I've got a mole fraction of zero, i.e., there's no A in there, and if you like, this one goes backwards, right? And a hundred percent B, so that's you know one point O B, yeah, zero A, yeah. So zero A. The pressure of A is zero, right? So that means it's 100% B, mole fraction of one. That means this blue line is its maximum. So that's the natural vapor pressure. That would be P naught B, right there, there. As I increase the amount of A, I simultaneously decrease the amount of B until I get, at this point, 100% or mole fraction of one A and zero B, and that would be the natural vapor pressure of A. Okay, there we go. So if you like the red line, is just the partial pressure changing with the amount of stuff. It's proportional, right? So twice as much stuff is twice as much pressure. It's at a fixed temperature, right? So it's not exponential. We're at 25, so there's no exponential part. It's now a linear relationship. The vapor pressure of a component is proportional to its mole fraction. No pressure, no stuff, right? Mole fraction of one, it's all that's there. It's its natural vapor pressure of that temperature, 25 degrees C. Other one runs backwards because it's you know a complementary mixture, and there we go. Now, if I'm going to look at this equation, right, so that at any point on this graph, so if I've got 50-50, right, 50-50 is there, right? So 50-50 mixture, it's going to be the partial pressure of A, which is from here to here, plus the partial pressure of B, which is from here to here, add those two together and it gets me to the top, right? So this one plus this one, if I put it on top, so to speak, it gets to there, right? So that top line is a combination of the distance to here and the distance to here. Partial pressure of A plus the partial pressure of B, right? Okay, and then we get a line for the total. So that's how that graph works. That graph is just a picture, if you like, of Dalton's law of partial pressures, we call it Routes law. Now we call it an ideal solution because the lines are straight. We'll see when the lines curve a little bit in a moment. But hopefully that makes sense, right? And then each one of these, we could, if we had to, we could substitute mole fraction times natural vapor pressure for this if we wanted to, like if we did some math later, for example. So these, you know, these can be subbed in. And if I want to do that real quick, maybe I'll just go up on the side over here. So PT equals, instead of writing PA, I'm going to write XA, P naught A, plus XB, P naught B, B. <laughs> yeah, so I just, I just subbed it in, right, just subbed it in. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. That's Routes law. The total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures for a mixture of volatile materials above, you know, their liquids. Okay, then if I want to figure out the partial pressure kind of independently, it's the mole fraction times its natural vapor pressure at 25 degrees C. All right, now that information, as I mentioned, is known, right? So we know what these natural vapor pressures are at 25 degrees C for pure materials. This allows us to do some calculations. All right, so let's, let's look at it, right? So work example, old homework question, right? A solution contains 50 grams of heptane and 50 grams of octane. Now, in a minute, we'll get back to that. That's a 50-50 mass ratio, right, in the liquid phase, yeah. Okay, fair enough, right? Okay, what that will allow us to do is work out a mole fraction, right? Okay. The vapor pressures of the pure materials are at 25 degrees C, which is standard conditions for vapor pressure. 45.8 torr and 10.9 torr, respectively. We don't have to turn them into any other unit like atmospheres. We don't because, you know, zero torr is zero pressure. So we can always work, it's proportional. So we can work in torr, right? Now, question. <clears throat> Calculate the vapor pressure of each of the solution components. So we want the partial pressure of, right? Let's call it heptane. And we want the partial pressure of octane. 
right? So which equation are we going to use? Well, it, does, it wants individual, right? So we're going to use that one, right? So it equals okay times the natural pressure. All right. Now in class, I'll have you work it out, right? I'll have you work out the mole fraction, right? So the mole fraction is mole fraction of heptane equals moles of heptane over moles heptane plus moles octane. So you'd work out the moles of one and the moles of the other, and then the fraction is just that ratio, isn't it, right? Now I'm not going to do that, right, because I've got the number here, right? I'm just going to write the answers, right? So here, P heptane, so I'm going to bring this down here, equals, turns out the mole fraction is 0.54, it's a fraction, no units, and heptane is re respectively, so that's the heptane number, 45.8 tor equals 24.3 tor. Okay, so that's the partial pressure of heptane above a mixture of 50 grams of each volatile material, right? Partial pressure of octane equals, well, you can work it out again, or you just say, well, it adds up to 100, because it adds up to 1, actually, 100%, 1 is a number. It's just the difference to 1, isn't it? So that's 0.46 as a mole fraction times 10.9 tor equals 5.1 tor. Okay, fair enough. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Let me just go through it one more time, right? So we have a container, maybe I'll draw a picture. All right. There's a container, 50 grams of heptane, 50 grams of octane sitting in there, right? And they're going to get into a, a situation where I've got a partial pressure of heptane and a partial pressure of octane. They're both volatile, they both evaporate. Okay, when we look at this mixture up here, right, the pressure of one of them, one of the components, is its mole fraction, and we work out the moles in the liquid components, right? So the mole fraction times its natural vapor pressure when it's evaporating from the pure liquid, and we get our partial pressure of heptane. Work it through again, partial pressure of octane. All right. Now, <clears throat> oh. About four minutes left, so uh, <laughs> before the, I have to stop again and start again, okay? So, next question what is the total pressure? Total pressure, right? So, that's that one, isn't it? PT. This is so easy, it's silly, right? It's going to be the heptane plus the octane. We just got those from the previous question, didn't we, right? So, that's going to be 24.3 tor plus 5.1 tor. 29.4 tor, two hours in tor. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So the total pressure above that mixture is 29.4 tor. Now, <laughs> just enough time to give you this kind of challenge question. Okay, this is so far, this is kind of the standard we meet in questions. But occasionally they get a little tricky, right? So remember what I said on the last page? It was 50 grams of heptane and 50 grams of octane sitting in a solution, right? So by weight, it's a 50-50 solution, isn't it? It's 50% by mass of each component, okay? What's the mass percent in the vapor, though, right? Because if you think about it, the more volatile one's going to be more of, but maybe it weighs less, right? So, you know, we've got to figure out somehow what is the mass percent of each one in the vapor somehow, right? Now here's the big trick, right? So when we work out mass percent, mass percent is the mass of one of them over the sum of the two masses times 100 for a percent, right? So we can do it, because it's only two components, maybe one's 70, the other's going to be 30. So we work out one and do the other difference to 100, right? That's what we want to find. But we have no idea how much of those two components weigh, right? up in the solution, yeah, uh, sorry, up in the vapor pressure stage, right? Okay, so here's the trick. Remember this one, molecular weight, grams and moles. 
grams equals molecular weight times moles. Since grams equals molecular weight times moles, hmm, we won't actually be able to work out the exact mass of each one, but it doesn't matter because we can do it proportionally. We're going to divide out, right? So therefore, mass percent is proportional to well, it's going to be equal to when we divide them out. So the mass of A is really the molecular weight times the moles. So grams is that, right? Actually, let me just back up a second. That is true, but the moles is proportional to the pressure. Okay, so let me just rephrase that. So we want the mass percent, which is the mass of one component over the mass of the mixture times 100, yeah? Grams is molecular weight times moles, but wait more stuff exerts more pressure. So therefore, this is what I'm trying to say. Grams is proportional to molecular weight times partial pressure, right? Ah, there we go. So what we can do, we can just sub in here. We can go, if you want to do heptane first, right? So the mass percent heptane equals, not grams of heptane, but molecular weight. Molecular weight, heptane, times partial pressure, heptane, over molecular weight, heptane, partial pressure heptane, plus, because we want the other one, molecular weight heptane, oh, octane, sorry, pressure octane. All right, so if you do that, I think it's somewhere around 81 to 19, so work it out. Okay, now what I want you to do, this is going to be extra credit, I kind of told you the answer already, but show your work, okay, and send me this, you know, just take a picture with your phone, do the work here and send it in an email, right? It's not like a formal test, so you just send me a picture, right? But show the work, show how you get the percent mass of one from the key relationship that grams is proportional to molecular weight times partial pressure. You got the partial pressures from the first question, okay? Then, <laughs> here's a big clue. <laughs> There are two reasons why it's not a 50-50 mixture, yeah? Okay, if you think about it, the partial pressure is really where the action is, yeah? So the higher the partial pressure, the more stuff's up there, so the more it weighs, right? So why isn't it a 50-50 mass ratio like in the liquid, right? Why is it different? Why is it 80 to 19 or whatever it is you work out, right? Well, it always it comes down here because partial pressure itself depends on two variables, right? Well, a constant and a variable, yeah. So. Just give me like a few sentences why the composition of the vapor is skewed in favor of one component and then tell me why. Why is it skewed in favor of that component? Because obviously first level answer is there's a higher vapor pressure of that thing. Why is there a higher vapor pressure? Well, there's an equation that tells you why there's a higher vapor pressure. <laughs> okay, I literally got, where am I? Oh, I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm probably continuing on the GoPro here, so maybe there's a sound quality difference, but uh, my main camera stopped. But uh, anyway, work from there. I'll see you guys in a couple of seconds. Hi, everyone. Had <laughs> a bit of a technical issue. My, uh, my video for the rest of this packet was recorded, but the, uh, the card and the camera was corrupted, so I'm going to have to record this whole thing again. So please excuse, but I've already written on the packet, so I'm not going to work it out in real time. I'll just kind of reveal what I wrote <laughs> a minute ago. Okay. So, Routes Law then, just a uh, quick reminder. Okay, so... Go back and show you my original note packet. Actually, there's the... Uh, let's just zoom down here, okay? Kind of cover this up. So. There's the original ideal Routes Law plot, right? So what that is, remember, Routes Law is a kind of a graphical representation of Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures, okay? So for any mole fraction, okay, you can add the component, which would be partial pressure A, with partial pressure B and make the total, right? So this height plus this height equals this height. Okay, and as we transition from none of A and all of A, so mole fraction zero, mole fraction one respectively, so that would be the partial pressure of pure B, and as A increases and B decreases, the partial pressure of pure A, and they just add directly in a linear fashion. Okay, now what we see 
And that's when, let me just express that. So ideal behavior was when the solute solvent bonds are of a similar strength to the solvent solvent bond. So there's no real strength difference when dissolving between solvent solvent turning into solvent solute. And then we have ideal behavior. Okay, now bear that in mind because when we do see deviations from Routes law, it's because of divergence in the intermolecular bond strength comparison. Okay, so <clears throat> not all solutions are ideal. Some have what we call a positive deviation from Routes law. They give a higher vapor pressure. And some have a negative deviation. They give a lower vapor pressure than you expect. Okay, so let's look at them. So this first one here, that's a positive deviation, okay? So for a positive deviation, we see a higher vapor pressure for the mixture than we would expect based on just the straight math, okay? Why would that be? Now think about that in terms of intermolecular forces, right? If the solvent and the solute form that intermolecular force to form a solution, yeah? If that bond is weaker than it previously was solvent solvent. What do you think happens? Well, if it's a weaker bond, it's easier to break, easier to evaporate, so we get a higher vapor pressure. So under cases, we get a positive deviation. Just think positive, think weaker intermolecular forces between solvent and solute, okay? Fair enough, right? Then the other one is, well, what happens when, you know, you mix two things and the bonds between the solvent and the solute become stronger? Well, then they're going to evaporate less because they're more strongly stuck together. And then we see what we call a, a negative deviation. So that's stronger. So in simple terms, we have answer, weaker solvent-solute bonds, higher vapor pressure for the mixture. For negative deviation, stronger solvent-solute bonds, negative deviation, lower pressure for the mixture. Okay, and we see that in a summary down here. So there is uh, your ideal solution, similar intermolecular forces between solvent and solute. We have a nice, perfect Dalton's law of partial pressures plot. We have a negative deviation, so that was this one up here. So we see stronger solute solvent interactions. We see a lowering of vapor pressure because they're sticking to each other rather than evaporating. And then we see for this one up here, we see a positive weak solvent solute interaction. Okay, so that's the qualitative thing. We'd not ever work out the numbers on that. Just be aware that, you know, if you see a kind of a bowing up or down, it's because of weakening or strengthening of bonds in the solution. Okay, now moving forward. Now then, this should be easier, but people always get like the concept wrong, right? Okay, so what we're going to start looking at now is actually a simpler piece of mathematics, okay? But it's again the concept, yeah? So the bottom line is we're going to start looking at mixtures with a volatile solvent, say it's hexane or something like that, right? Just like before, but the thing we're dissolving is non-volatile. So actually in this case it's water as a solvent, right? I'm going to add sugar or salt, right? And you know just from your everyday experience that if I make some salt water and just leave it there, eventually all the water will evaporate, right? Vapor pressure and leave the salt behind. The salt's left behind because it has a super high boiling point, right? Not high enough to evaporate. Okay, so in that case the salt's not going to make a vapor pressure. Not going to make a vapor pressure. So it's only going to be water above that mixture. So I drew a little picture, right? So maybe you've got something like this. So there's my NaCl aqueous, right? If I've got a closed container, it's only H2O vapor above there because it's the volatile solvent in volatile, non-volatile solute. Okay, so you think, oh, it's just like water then, isn't it? Well, not for the math, because if you think about it, mole fraction plays a part, right? There's actually if you like, less water down here now because it's mixed with salt, right? So the mole fraction of water in that mixture is slightly lowered when you dissolve salt. Slightly less water, then slightly less vapor pressure. So all we've got to do is just work out that mole fraction and it'll be a slight reduction, okay, in vapor pressure than what you expect for the pure material. So it's quite actually easy then. So let's look at this worked example. So calculate the vapor pressure, 25 degrees C, usual standard temperature, right? Okay. For the for 95.5 grams of sugar, actually sucrose, sugar, salt, you know, non-volatile, right? Sugar and 300 milliliters of water. We assume water weighs one gram per milliliter. Okay. Now the vapor pressure of pure water, 
at that temperature. So we have, if you like, P0H2O equals 23.8 torr. So think about that, right? Remember that simple equation we used before? If we want the vapor pressure, it's the mole fraction times the pure pressure, isn't it, right? And that's all we're gonna do. We're just gonna use that one simple equation. No complications with the mixture this time. So yeah, we're gonna use this equation. Okay, that's the mole fraction of water because water is what evaporates, right? Vapor pressure of pure water, partial pressure of water above the solution, okay? So to do that, we've got to find the mole fraction. How do you find the mole fraction? Well, it's going to be moles of sucrose, moles of water, and then, hey, because you want mole fraction of water, it's going to be moles of water over moles of total sugar and water, okay? Now, I'm not going to work out the moles for you. You can do that. You've got the formula and the molecular weight. Sorry, you've got the formula so you can get molecular weight. You've got the grams. Work out moles of sucrose, right? And then, hey, 300 grams, 18 grams per mole, work out moles of water. And you can actually work chi out, right? So find the mole fraction. There you go, right? So that's a good place to pause. Right? I'm going to reveal the work in a second, but it's a good place to pause. Try it, right? So work out the mole fraction of water, which is, of course, moles of water over total moles, water and sugar, okay? Work out that mole fraction. It's going to be a lot, right? Because it's mostly water, yeah? So it's going to be a high mole fraction point high number, nine, something like that, right? Nine something probably. We'll look in a minute. Okay, pause, come back. All right, let's look. So when we execute this one, turns out <laughs> moles of water, so, you know, 300 grams turns out is 16.7 moles of water, right? And then 95 grams, 95.5 grams of sugar is actually 0.27 grams of sugar, uh, moles of sugar rather. So, you know, the total is 16.7 of water, 0.27 of sugar. We want the mole fraction of uh, water rather. So there we go. Times the natural vapor pressure. Let's zoom back a sec. Remember, we're just basically inserting into this equation. We've got this, we've got this. What is the vapor pressure? 23.4. So it's pretty close to the what was the 23.8, right? So it's only 0.4 less because that mixture is mostly water, right? So it's mostly acting like water. It's been kind of, you know, pulled back a little bit because of the slightly reduced mole fraction of water because it's a non-volatile solute, right? Sugar. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Now, what I've got on the next page is a very, very similar question. Okay, and it says extra credit there. I'll make it worth two points of extra credit, right? So it says, calculate the vapor pressure, ethylene glycol and water. Now we're gonna assume ethylene glycol is not volatile. It's a very syrupy-like material, right? Okay, so ethylene glycol, non-volatile. In any question, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll explicitly say when I do this on a test or something, you know, the non-volatile solute or the volatile solute, so you know which math to use previous math or this math, right? So try it, very similar to the last one. Crank it out and, you know, feel free just to take a, you know, work it out and you know, remember what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to kind of write in your notes as you go, all right? Just take a picture with your phone of this page and just kind of uh, attach it to an email, send it me. So I'm okay with pictures for extra credit, right? So just send me the picture from the notes for extra credit, plus two by Friday, right? Okay. Now, as with um, our first colloidal property, which was the raising of boiling point and the lowering of freezing point, right? It's all about the number of particles in the way, essentially, because what you're doing is disrupting bonding, intermolecular bonding between solvent molecules, right? And that has different effects, as we've seen, okay? Now, why do we use molality, little m? Because we're used to using large concentrations, right? Okay? And why is that even a thing? Well, it kind of says down here, right? So, <clears throat> remember, when we did NaCl, we actually got two ions in solution, and my little I number was two. It's twice as many particles in the way because it was two dissociation products from an ionic material. Ethylene, glycol, sugar, alcohol, don't break apart. So molecules, anything starting, you know, C something, H something, always one, right? One molecule, no dissociation. But ionic materials, yeah, they fall apart. We've seen that, right? So just reminding you there. Okay, so we multiply out by the number of ions it makes, if you like, and that's my I factor, right? So sodium chloride, two. All right, so if I put 0.1 sodium chloride in water, there'll be 0.2 moles per liter of things in the way because it's making two per formula unit. Now, back to the thing. So, <laughs> here's a stupid question. You know those power couples? Uh, what's it? J-rod, 
Jennifer Lopez and Alex Rodriguez and uh, back in the day, Benifer, right? Ben Affleck and Jennifer, was it, no, whatever, and Anderson, right? Okay, so two people become one person, right? And then they go do everything together. And you see this in real life too. Here are a couple of, <laughs> this is the girlfriend, this is the trained <laughs> boyfriend. That's a joke. <laughs> so they're wearing, they're wearing the identical outfits, right? That's never the guy's idea, let's be honest. <laughs> I'm joking, right? But now they act as one, right? So they're kind of one thing. They're benefit, right? Okay. And in a solution, this actually happens with ions at high concentrations. So at high concentrations, we see ions, and I've got a better picture here. <coughs> at high concentrations, the ions are actually forced together and they might make what's called ion pairs. Okay. So these two things are like <laughs> the two people in the photograph. They're acting two are acting as one, right? So that means they're not really acting as two ions anymore, they're just acting like one thing, right? So it's kind of a taxation effect. So the more the concentration goes up, it turns out that you're getting less and less as a fraction of ions in solution. Yeah, the absolute number increases, but then you're getting like maybe an average of 1.9, not two or something, as you get to higher concentrations. And those are called Van Hoff factors, all right? So we never really test this. If you take a higher level chemistry course, we, we'd multiply it by the Van Hoff factor. But at certain concentrations, we see these kind of taxation rates, if you like. So for an electrolyte like sugar, hey, one makes one, never, doesn't matter, right? Because it's always one thing. But sodium chloride, you expect to, you get 1.9. You expect two, you get 1.3. You expect three, you get 2.7, etc. Right? So you know there is a slight kind of diminishing as concentration increases. It's not exactly an average of two extra things when it, it's actually an average of 1.9, for example, for sodium chloride. So be aware of that. We we'll never use it, but it does exist, right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> flip over the page here. Ah, last topic. <laughs> kind of a fun one to finish. So osmotic pressure, okay? I should probably cover up the answer, right? <laughs> uh, now, there's some classic jokes out there revolving osmosis, right? So here's a picture of Garfield, and he's like, Garfield doesn't know anything, right? And he's trying to learn through osmosis. So what he's done, he's taken a bunch of textbooks, and he's physically attached them to himself, right? And there's the student doing the same thing, right? So explain the joke. Then you're talking to a non-chemist, right? Oh, you know, someone says to you, oh, I'm learning through osmosis, and you say to them, what does that really mean? Okay, what does it mean? Well, it means, in terms of this picture, when you learn through osmosis, you, you're getting into physical contact with a thing with a high concentration of knowledge, which is this textbook, right? And then the knowledge will flow from high concentration to low. It will flow from the textbook into you. Right, so that's learning by osmosis. And it kind of mirrors the actual scientific definition of what osmosis actually is. Things of a high concentration will move to an area of low concentration to make the concentration equal all the way through. And that's entropy-driven mixing. Remember we talked about that on the very first page in the packet, right? So things will naturally mix, and the kind of the driving force behind entropy-driven mixing is, yeah, randomization. And we can kind of quantify that with osmotic pressure, right? So osmotic pressure isn't really a pressure like this, right? But it can be a, a kind of analog analogized, if that's the word, with pressure, right? So the force that drives mixing is osmotic pressure. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just reveal that. So osmosis, if you like, is the driving force or, if you like, outcome of entropy-driven mixing. Okay, so things will move from high to low concentration, and then the whole container eventually will be the same concentration. Okay, that's driven by osmotic pressure. All right, now, you can explain this very easily with um, everyday life, right? Sea waters and hangovers, right? Okay, now, <laughs> did you ever get a hangover? <laughs> okay, so how do hangovers work? Well, hangovers work through osmosis, it turns out, okay? So when you drink, and it works with seawater too, so drinking alcohol and drinking seawater has the same effect. It dehydrates you, right? So here's your kind of intestinal lining, right? So there's this porous or semi-porous barrier, right, which separates your gut from your inside body. This is the inside body over here. This is the gut over here. And I got that the right way around, okay? So when you have salt water in your gut or, you know, an alcoholic drink in your gut, right, the water in your gut is being, it's actually dissolving alcohol or salt, isn't it, right? Okay? So this 
permeable membrane here, right? It's got like little perforations which allow small molecules to cross it, yeah? Okay, so it's what we call semi-permeable. Because there's less salt in your blood or less alcohol in your blood than in your stomach, the water actually transports, right? So the water transports from your blood into your gut, right, to make the concentration of salt less over here. So it makes it kind of equal, right? So it's trying to equalize the concentration of salt in both, both places or the concentration of alcohol in both places. It doesn't move the salt, no. <laughs> it doesn't move the alcohol. <laughs> already did that. <laughs> right? There's always some left, right? So it actually moves the water into the gut to kind of dilute out here, yeah? And if you think about it, water coming out of your blood is dehydrating, right? So when we have something really salty, when we have some alcohol, right? Water comes out of our blood into our bloodstream. And people who own bars know this. This is why they sell lots of salty snacks. Oh, free, free chips with your beer. Fine, I'll eat some chips. Oh, I feel more thirsty. Why is that? Because this is happening, right? So a good hangover cure, if you have, <laughs> don't buy the little tablets, right? Because the little tablet that's a hangover cure says, you know, take with two glasses of water. It's the water that cures the hangover because it goes back over there. <laughs> right? So if you ever want to avoid a hangover, take two pints of water before you go to bed. Right? Okay? And this is why, you know, if you're ever kind of shipwrecked and you're in a lifeboat, you can never drink the salt water because just for a second you feel great because you've just drunk something. But then the, the, what remaining water you have in your body will come out and you'll just dehydrate even though you just drunk some salt water. Okay, there was actually a famous uh, incident a few years ago now, but some Philippine fishermen got lost and uh, they're in their boat, they got no water. So what they do to survive, and they find them like several weeks later and they're all living. Well, what did you drink? Well, we caught turtles and we drank their blood. <laughs> That's how they survive, right? Okay, so now in terms of a kind of a an academic example, right? Why do we use osmotic pressure as a driving force? Well, look at this, right? So, <clears throat> let's say you have a YouTube, right? Okay, YouTube, and then you put your semi-porous barrier there, all right? So, you know, small molecules can go back and forwards through the barrier, just like your gut wall, right? On this side, you put salt water. On this side, you put regular water. Now, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Just like in the gut, right? The water is gonna go that way to dilute this out, yeah? Now, because we started with equal levels, this level is going to go down because some water went through, right? So this is kind of before and after. Now, if you remember your Chemistry 101, how we used to measure pressure is with a height difference in a manometer tube, right? So you can actually equate the height difference to a pressure. So the actual equation is pressure is mgh, right? So, you know, you may remember that from 101, maybe not. But bottom line is, because this went down a little bit, that means there's a pressure being exerted. There's a kind of a pressure forcing the water through the semi-porous barrier. Therefore, we call it osmotic pressure, right? It's not really a pressure as we know it, right? It's a force that kind of looks like pressure, so we call it osmotic pressure, okay? So the osmotic pressure is the force that's trying to make these two concentrations equal, okay? All right, so the height difference can be related to a pressure, so we call it osmotic pressure. Now, wait a minute, we already have a, an equation for pressure, right? PV equals NRT. We can actually use that equation and just change a few variables and it works. So we'll show you that. Okay. Here it is. So osmotic pressure math, right? Now, I kind of went through it, <laughs> obviously, already, so, but I'll show you again, right? So if I just tell you the variables here, so this big old capital pi here, is the so-called osmotic pressure, right? M is concentration in moles per liter, that's molarity, right? You can throw an I in there, you know, just like before, if there's NaCl, there'd be two, right? Gas constant, just like the uh, gas law equation, liters atmosphere is moles Kelvin, 0 0.08206 actually, right? And then temperature in Kelvin, okay? Now, it is actually derived from PV equals NRT. Now think about it for a second, right? We wanna find essentially pressure, right? Osmotic pressure. So we're gonna divide both sides by V. And if you think about it, moles divided by volume is concentration, right? So all we've done to make this equation is divided both sides by V. N moles over V volume is concentration, which we call now M, all right, molarity. Okay, so it's actually an easier version, if you like, of um, PV equals NRT. So, let's look at it. Now, back in the day, we used to use osmotic pressure to find the molecular weight, because, hey, concentration, moles, liters, you know, we can work out molecular weight as well, okay? 
We used to find the molecular weight of large macromolecules like proteins. This is a classic old biochemistry kind of technique. Nowadays we use a different method, but hey, back in the day, this is how they did it, right? So let's look at it. So the osmotic pressure of a solution, so you know, you've used that YouTube situation, right? Measure the height, right? So the osmotic pressure of a solution containing this many milligrams of a protein in 10 milliliters, so we can work out concentration, right, was 2.45 torr. So the osmotic pressure is 2.45 torr, right? Find the molar mass of the protein. So here's the game plan, right? Now, because it's an osmotic pressure, just treat it like a PV equals NRT. Write the variables in the margin, okay? And then kind of come up with a game plan, right? So, yeah, the pressure is 2.45, put it there, right? But if you remember my 101, the first thing I always used to write was R, right? Because R, yeah, it's this number, but the units are important. So it's liters, atmosphere, moles, Kelvin. That's torr. That has to be an atmosphere. So on the fly, I've just converted it to, hey, one atmosphere is 760 torr, 0 0.00322 atmospheres, right? I need atmospheres. And if you like, just kind of keep track, right? Okay. I is one because it's a molecule. It's a protein, right? So it's not dissociating. It's not ionic. It's a natural molecule. So I is one, if you like. Molecular weight is kind of our variable because if we think about it, if we find, sorry, Concentration is our variable because we find concentration, which will then allow moles. Moles, grams of molecular weight will allow molecular weight. All right. So our destination from the initial phase of this work is to find concentration. R is known. Temperature 25 degrees C. Add 273298 Kelvin. Got Kelvins. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> rearrange it to make M the subject. There it is. Pressure, IRT, atmospheres, one molecule. R and T298, Kelvin, right? Kelvin. Find the concentration. So the concentration is 1.32 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter. So hopefully you got that right. Now, what I want you to do is pause me, right? Because if you think about it, I'll do it right here. Concentration is moles per volume. You have the volume, 10 milliliters. You now have the concentration, so you can figure out moles. Once you've got moles, molecular weight, grams, and moles. All right, once you've got moles, you've got the milligrams, you can figure out molecular weight, okay? So that's your journey, right? Find the moles from concentration and volume. you just got concentration. Volume is 10 milliliters, has to be in liters. And then, hey, once you've got that, once you've got moles, use the relationship molecular weight is grams divided by moles to find the molecular weight. All right, try it. You back? All right, let's look at it. So real quick, moles equals CV. 1.3 times 10 to the minus 4 times, has to be in liters, 10 milliliters in liters, 1.32 times 10 to the minus 6 moles, right? Hey, I did it down here. 5.57 milligrams, let's move that up. 5.57 milligrams times 10 to the minus 3 grams divided by grams per mole, we just figured out. It was 4.4 thousand, right? 400 and 4,446 grams per mole, which is a big number, yeah, we're normally like 18 water, right? But no, this is a giant macromolecule of protein, so we kind of see big numbers, right? And if you think about it, that's kind of interesting because normally we work out molecular weights with mass spectroscopy, you may remember that, right? Okay, but it's hard to get like a lump of meat into a mass spectrometer, right? Until, until they were able to do it with a special technique, and I always include this as an extra credit, right? Because back in the day, UV MALDI, right, which is stands for ultraviolet matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, <laughs> was able to get macromolecules into the gas phase and then throw them through a mass spectrum. So we can get a mass spectrum of a massive protein now, right, and measure its mass spectrum, measure its mass very easily, right? Plus two points of extra credit. Describe what UV MALDI is, right? And then the next one. What is reverse osmosis? Okay, what is reverse We use reverse osmosis in our chemistry lab to actually purify water, right? So if we've got water with impurities in it, we can actually essentially, and I'll give you a big clue, we can literally apply pressure on the other end to force water through, right? So reverse osmosis is kind of overpowering the natural kind of osmosis pressure, making it run backwards. That's what it is. So give me 100 words on that for plus two there. So two points for a reverse osmosis discussion, two points for a UV Maldi discussion. All right. Finally, <laughs> the last one, bloody solution. Okay, so hemoglobin is a protein. Very similar question to before. 
I'm setting this as just practice, right? I'm not going to give you any extra credit for that. I am going to provide the answer. So the answer to this practice question is 0 0.390 tor. So you're going to solve for osmotic pressure. So just rearrange the equation, work it back. Similar variables to what's before. So you're given the molecular weight, you got the volume, you got the milligrams. You can actually use the two triangles to get back to concentration. Throw the concentration in the osmotic pressure equation, you've got osmotic pressure. Okay, so there we go. Now that's working out perfect. We've just got about one minute left, so I'll stop there. Fingers crossed the card works. If you can see me, it worked. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> just, I'll find out. I'll find out in a second. Okay, see you guys next time. High five. Hi everyone, here's something fun. So occasionally I like to give you a surprise extra credit. So if you're watching this, okay, congratulations. You have hopefully reached the end of the last uh, video. Okay, and here's my happy smiling face, right? If you're here and you're watching this before the deadline for watching this video, send me an email immediately with the line in the, in the, in the title, give me five. Right, give me five points of extra credit. I'm giving you five points of extra credit for getting to this video on time. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, see you next time. High five! Great.